This lecture focuses on the final market structure that we're going to study in this class, and that is oligopoly. Oligopoly is the Greek word for few sellers. And um, what we mean by that is there are few dominant firms in the industry. There are just a few sellers that really matter, that have a lot of market power, that control the majority of sales in the industry. Um, there may be a bunch of other producers that don't um, account for very many of the market sales and therefore don't have much market power. So an oligopolistic industry, again, just has a few, I'd say three to five or six companies, dominant companies that control almost all the sales. The products are going to be standardized or differentiated. Um, they are usually standardized for industrial goods such as steel, oil, glass, etc. and differentiated for the consumer goods that we're more familiar with seeing and hearing about like cars, cereal, airlines, um, etc. things like that. And in oligopoly, there are high barriers to entry, which, which makes it very hard to enter the market. Um, because of this, the sellers have a lot of market power because they can keep other companies from really coming in and making a difference. So sellers do have the ability to control prices and output. And oftentimes, they operate with what's known as a price leadership system, where one of the firms will change their prices and the others will follow. And in oligopoly, there's potential for long-run profits. Now, you're going to notice a theme as we go through and talk about oligopoly today. And oligopoly is kind of the wild card of the market structures because there are a lot of unknowns in the long run. Um, anything can happen because with just a few key players in the game, um, it's hard to know what they're going to do and how they're going to act and react to one another. So we'll say many times today, Anything can happen. We don't know what's going to happen in the long run. It depends on what the firms do, and that's just that's very true. There are many unknowns. And an oligopolistic market, the oligopolistic markets produce the largest share of the GDP in our country. So the majority of the output is in oligopoly markets. All right, in oligopoly, there's tension between cooperation and self-interest. So the firms are what we call interdependent. Each firm knows that any changes in its product quality, price, output, or advertising policy may prompt a reaction from its rivals. And each firm may react if another firm alters any of these features. So the more homogenous or the more similar or identical the product, the greater the interdependence is among the few dominant firms. Um, the more similar their products, the more they have to pay attention to what each other is doing. And that makes sense. As I mentioned, behavior is harder to predict in oligopoly markets than it is in the other market structures that we've studied, especially in the long run. We really can't predict what's going to happen all the time. And this is a great analogy. Monopolistic competition is like a golf tournament in which each player is striving for a personal best. Oligopoly is more like a tennis match where each player's actions depend on how and where the opponent hits the ball. So again, monopolistic competition and oligopoly are similar in some respects but different because in monopolistic competition we can predict what's going to happen. Each firm is going to produce at their profit maximizing output and adjust that quantity as the demand for their product changes as firms enter and exit the industry. But in oligopoly we don't know what's going to happen. It's more of a game of, of reaction to what others are doing among the few dominant firms that matter. Alright, to, to decide if a firm is oligopolistic. Um, economists use a measure called the herfindahl hirschman Index, or the HHI. The HHI of an industry is the square of each firm's share of market sales summed over the firms in the industry. So for example here, if an industry contains only three firms and their market shares are 60%, 25%, and 15%, then the HHI for the industry is as shown, 60 squared plus 25 squared plus 15 squared, or 4,450. Well, you might wonder what that number means. According to the Justice Department guidelines, an HHI below 1,000 indicates a strongly competitive market. Um, if the HHI is between 1,000 and 1,800, it's a somewhat competitive market, and anything over 1,800 includes or indicates that it's an oligopoly. So, in an industry with an HHI over 1,000, 
A merger that results in a significant increase in the HHI will receive special scrutiny and is likely to be disallowed. Here is the rubric that is used, and you don't have to memorize this rubric, but just so you know that there actually is a system that's mathematically based um, that the Justice Department uses to decide if mergers are allowed or not. So if the market is very competitive to begin with and it's not going to increase the HHI by much, then the merger is likely going to be allowed. But the more um, competitive the market is to begin with and the more it increases the HHI by, the less likely the merger is going to be allowed to occur. And just to give you some ideas for HHIs in various industries, you'll notice um, the, the spectrum here. The highest one here is PC operating system, so it's not including Mac, but that's it has an HHI at 9,182, and you'll know that you'll notice that this uh, this industry was already split once by the U.S. Justice Department, um, and then we go all the way down to the bottom where there are many more competitors in the market, so there's less market power for each individual firm that's there, like retail grocers. All right, so there are three ways we can um, analyze oligopolistic behavior because there's three basic ways that they could act. First of all, they could act as a cartel. The dominant firms in the industry could act as a cartel and then um, analyze the market as though it were a monopoly working together. Um, the firms could be sales maximizers or the firms could engage in non-cooperative behavior. So notice the spectrum here. On one end of the spectrum, the firms work together, which is illegal in the United States, by the way. And on the other end of the spectrum, the, fear, the, the firms do not work together. They um, don't co cooperate at all, and they are fierce competitors. So let's look at the first possibility. If an oligopoly industry is operating as though it were a monopoly, what happens is the major dominant firms in the oligopoly will come together, and again, this is not legal in the United States, but it, is, it has happened before. The firms come together to agree on a monopoly outcome and seek to maintain high profits. So they engage in collusion which is an agreement among firms to fix prices or quantity. And a cartel, just so you know these two words and understand the lingo, is a group of firms that's acting in unison. So a cartel is kind of a is formal collusion that's occurring. And these firms that have decided they're going to work together, even though it's not um, allowed, is they, they divide up the monopoly quantity of the market amongst themselves. So they analyze the market as though it were a monopoly, and divide up the monopoly profit maximizing quantity and each produces a portion of that quantity and sells at that monopoly price. So what's going to happen is if this were the market, this is the monopoly profit maximizing quantity and price to be charged and the firms are going to divide that quantity up amongst the dominant firms that are colluding. It's difficult for oligopolists to operate in this manner, especially in the long run, because they have differences in cost and in profit. Um, the higher the number of firms in the cartel, the more difficult it is to negotiate acceptable allocation of production. And when new entry comes into the industry, you have to either convince the new entrant to come on board with you, or they bust you. <laughs> and there's a high incentive to cheat because cheating could increase the profits and the outcome for the, the cheating firm. So cheaters win <laughs> in these scenarios. So it's very um, it's it's uh, very tempting to cheat. Okay, option number two is oligopolists sometimes act as sales maximizers. Oligopolists can operate as revenue maximizers, which means they want to sell as much output as possible. And this is where they will produce until no more revenue can be generated. So as we learned, um, a firm is not going to produce when MR is negative because then they're in the inelastic portion of their demand curve causing total revenue to fall. So at that point when marginal revenue equals zero, that is the, the highest possible level of output that a producer would ever possibly sell. 
And again, this isn't going to be their profit maximizing point because that's where MR equals MC. This is past their profit maximizing point and they're sacrificing some profits just to get more sales. So let's take a look at this on the graph. This is the, the um, profit maximizing point of output for the firm where MR equals MC and the profit maximizing price that would be, char be charged like if this firm was acting as a monopoly. But if this oligopolist wanted to sales maximize, they're going to produce a quantity consistent with MR equals zero and then reference the demand curve to find the price they would charge. And you'll notice that the profits at the sales maximizing level of output are much smaller than the profits at the profit maximizing level of output. Um, and that's pretty common sense. Profit maximizing level of output is going to yield the highest profits. So why would a firm want to produce at their sales maximizing level of output or any other quantity <laughs> that doesn't include the profit maximizing quantity. Um, the reason that sometimes oligopoly firms want to increase their sales as much as possible is that many oligopoly firms are managed by people who are not the owners of the company. Stockholders own publicly traded companies and oligopolistic companies are typically corporations that you can purchase stock in. And so, since there are so many stockholders in most companies, they elect a board of directors and CEO to make the decisions for the firm. Those CEOs and boards of directors for these companies are oftentimes compensated based on the company size, as measured by sale volume, rather than the profit that they're actually bringing in to the company, which is a little counterintuitive, but it's just the way that it is. So, if a company can sales maximize, their goal is to take over a higher percentage of the market share and in this fiercely competitive oligopolistic industry um, that's that's often what happens firms sacrifice some profits just to try to sell more and take over more of the market alright the third and final approach to analyzing oligopolistic behavior is called um, game theory and this is a representation of the kink demand curve so Let's take a look at the kink demand curve, which um, I told you not to focus too much on as you go through your reading. And the kink demand curve shows us why firms rarely change their prices. Um, it's hard to predict if other firms will follow or stick to their own prices because firms assume two different demand curves that reflect how firms could react. So this demand curve, D1, is the competition does not respond to firms' price changes. And this assumes that demand is elastic for their good. And people have more choices and are going to be more responsive to different prices. Um, D2 represents a demand curve that's inelastic. And this is when competition follows a firm's price changes. And so what happens is oligopolistic firms assume the worst and choose a portion of each demand curve um, that gives them the worst case scenario just in case so in the elastic they, they assume that they're going to be in the elastic portion of the curve if they raise prices and in the inelastic portion of the curve if they lower their prices which is not not what they're hoping for but worst case scenario and because of those kink demand curves um, a lot of firms engage in game theory so game theory is when a firm analyzes other competitors and makes decisions based on their potential decisions the study of behavior and situations of interdependence. And a payoff matrix is used to analyze strategy and react. So let's take a look at an example here quickly. Um, this is an example of a payoff matrix with the two players in the game being Camel and Marlboro. And each player has two possible strategies, to advertise or not advertise. If both companies advertise, they're each going to make $3 billion in profit. If neither, I'm sorry, if Marlboro doesn't advertise but Camel does, then Camel's going to make more profit than Marlboro. If Camel doesn't advertise but Marlboro does, then Marlboro's going to make more profit. And if neither advertise, you'll notice that they each make $4 billion in profit. So the best case scenario here is for neither to advertise. Um, however, neither firm can take the risk of not advertising because if they don't advertise and the other player happens to advertise, they're going to lose big time. So therefore, each player's dominant strategy is to advertise. 
and firms are, are not going to cooperate. Even when it makes them mutually better off, they can't trust each other. So when both firms advertise, that's known as the Nash Equilibrium in this game.